the big him up for. Let me help you. Oh. See Sister Kelly down there. See Ginger over there. And he's still working on those who are hospitals right now who are not here with us. And guess what? You are here. Let's bring him up. Hallelujah. God is good. If you don't know it, there's an expression that I've come to hold to my heart, and it's, but God. And I've had some situations that the only thing I can say is, but God. And I hope for you in your life that you are able to say, but God. Because on our own strength, we can't do it. But for God, we can do all things. Let's look to the Lord as we thank him and just bless him today. What an awesome opportunity, O oh God, to just be in your presence once again. Thank you, Father. Thank you, O oh God, for molding us and shaping us and building us and uh, creating us in a way that, Father, that we can bring you honor and glory. More importantly, Father, thank you for the energy that you've given us, our lips, our mouths, to be able to proclaim who you are, our hearts, so we can show your love. Father, thank you for this opportunity right now in your presence as a people of God. As we come to fellowship in your name, Father, we pray your Holy Spirit will inhabit this place, will touch lives, O oh God. More importantly, Father, that we will be restrengthened, that we will have the boldness as we walk with your Father to be true ambassadors of you. Father, bless your manservant, that he will come to deliver your word, O oh God, that it may touch, it may uh, give us the energy, may give us the insight, Father, the discernment, Father, to further do your will. Bless this time and all those who may participate. Thank you, O oh God, for those who are here, for those who are on their way, O oh God. And we thank you, O oh God, for your many blessings that you bestow upon us, your people. Get on and glory from this time in your presence. In Jesus' name, we give you thanks. And may all God's people say, Amen. 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 We have the joy together to proclaim God's word from Psalms 33 as our part of our call to worship. If it's not up in front of you, you can look in your bulletins. And I invite you to participate in reading along with me in your programs as we together from Psalms 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his hearts through all generations. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the, er the hearts of all who considers everything they do. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. Wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Let us sing to his honor and glory.
witness here today that you have come to worship. You have come to bow down. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. God for today. Anything at all. Anything. I want us to go back, Pastor Hannah, to the first song. I believe that when we come to worship, we must come as intelligent people, bringing something. And when God has done something deserving of a hallelujah, you shouldn't be ashamed to say so. So, yes, we didn't plan it. Things happen in our lives we have no control over. And the enemy comes and tells you, do not stop this nonsense but believing in God and what God could do for you. 
And all God wants for you is for you to affirm that you believe he can do what he said he could. That's why you worship God, because he could do beyond that which you could think or imagine, people. So Dougie, stand up. Did I not tell you like I told many others that God could work it out for you? And you can be okay? See, see, for those who don't have faith, those who don't have faith, you didn't see him when he was flat. Right out. You didn't see Sister Kelly when she didn't know what was going to happen. And so when you come here with nothing, I want to challenge you to bring something to your worship. The God I'm asking you to worship today is the God who do miracles, people. That's what it, you stop looking in the Bible for all your miracles. See, look around you. Got some right there for you. You can't tell me God is good and God is able to do these things if every now and then God don't show off and tell you. Listen to me. When I went to see Sister Kelly and prayed with her, I also prayed with my cousin, Judy. Well, you know what? God took Judy home. I went to Andrews to bury, help bury Judy two weeks ago. Same God. Same God. But you know what? He was just. He was right. He didn't shortchange Judy. He just said, Judy, 58 is all you need to do what you had to do. And guess what? My sister Jennifer could tell you the things that was testified about Judy. Some people need 200 years to get to do that. Apart from the three children God gave her, she took some other people, three. She raised three other children that didn't come out of her. And she has made an impact that is changing the community from where she lived. So friends, when you tell me you come here to worship, you better tell me the truth. Don't lie to me. Because it ain't important for, me, for you to lie to me because I can't do nothing for you. But God wants people to worship him in spirit and in truth. And don't tell me I take too long. Too bad for you. Too bad for you. If you got an issue, that's your business. Here I am to worship Pastor Hannah from the top. Those who have joined us late, we are here today worshiping, testifying of God's goodness. And nothing better than an encouragement for the soul.
before I get started with the scripture reading, I wanted to open up with a point. Uh, when I was eight years old, I was staying by my cousin Duet's house for the weekend, and I walked into the house, and these are the words I heard. Oh, Luke, I am your father. He was watching Star Wars, and uh, that had no meaning to me because I didn't watch the earlier part of the movie. And on this opposite note, one time I was staying by my uncle's house and my parents came to pick us up and I had only watched the first half an hour of the first Superman movie and I never saw the end. So I was left with the tension, like how does this, how does this finish? Well, the Bible is like that, it's a two-act play. If you read the Old Testament, you're left with a, well, what's going to happen kind of situation. And if you only read the New Testament, you don't even get what the point is. How could Jesus be the consolation of Israel if Israel didn't have a problem in the first place? All right, so we're going to open up with our scripture reading. Um, I'd like to stand, if you could stand for it. We'll be reading from Deuteronomy 29, 2 verses 4 and 9 through 10. Moses summoned all the Israelites and said to them, Your eyes have seen all that the Lord did in Egypt to Pharaoh, to all his officials, and to all his land. With your own eyes you saw those great trials, those signs and great wonders. But to this day the Lord has not given you a mind that understands, or eyes that see, or ears that hear. Carefully follow the terms of this covenant, so that you may prosper in everything you do. All of you are standing today in the presence of the Lord your God, your leaders and chief men, your elders and officials, and all other men in Israel. Together with your children and with your wives and the foreigners living in your camps who chop your wood and carry water, you are standing here in order to enter into a covenant with the Lord your God, a covenant the Lord is making with you this day and sealing with an oath to confirm you this day to all his people that he may be your God as he promised you and as he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God, but also with those who are not here today. You yourselves know how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries on the way here. You saw among them the detestable images, the idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold, Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you that produces such bitter poison. When such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke a blessing on themselves thinking, I will be safe even though I persist in going my own way, they will bring disaster on the watered land as well as the dry. The Lord will be never be willing to forgive them. His wrath and zeal will burn against them. All the curses written in this book will fall on them. The Lord will blot out their names from under heaven. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. One of the last sermons Moses gave before he left his people, he said to be in a covenant relationship with God. If we are to be in a covenant relationship with him, we must know first what a covenant is and what a covenant with God is. First, there's a uniqueness to the covenant in verses 12 and 13. Notice, we are not just a people, we are his people. We are not just a God, he is our God. Notice the intimacy, but also notice that it was sealed with an oath. This is the language of law. A covenant is a combination of love and law. It is more loving than a merely legal relationship, but more binding than a merely love relationship. The love is made more binding because it is made legal. The closest relationship is a spousal relationship, husband and wife, and second is a parent-child. Most people, when they enter into a relationship, act in a way that says to the other person, I will be what I will be, what I should be, as long as you will be what you should be. But a covenant properly understood is not like that. I've never seen a parent go to a child crying in the middle of the night, child, I want some water. It does not go both ways in that way. So a covenant relationship only works when both persons make and work the promise. Anything else is exploitation. Both give up their independence. This is the opposite of the relationship of a consumer relationship, like we have with our grocery stores. If we find a closer grocery store with better food and better prices, are we still going to go to our old grocery store? Because that's a consumer relationship. But that's not what we're talking about today. If the deepest and best relationships we have are spousal, and parental are both covenant relationships, of course our relationship with God must be the same. This is the only way he relates. 
the mystery of the covenant, verse 9. There are terms to the covenant, blessings and curses. This is what gives a covenant its teeth, its backbone. Otherwise, what good is a covenant if there are no repercussions? Make sure, verse 18, there is no woman, clan, or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from the Lord our God to go and worship the gods of those nations. Make sure there is no root among you who produces such bitter poison. When such a person hears the words of this oath and they invoke it, they will bring disaster on the watered lands of the dry. The Lord will never be willing to forgive them. God frequently says, I cannot bless a disobedient people. However, God is also forgiving and frequently says he will never leave his people. This is the great tension in the book. What is the Old Testament and the New Testament about? Will he neglect his holiness and give in to his people? Or will he neglect his faithfulness and abandon them? Are God's blessings conditional or unconditional? Remember, this is the mystery. Most people fall on either side. God loves you, but your actions don't matter. Do what you want. God knows my heart. Or they say God loves you, but ultimately you must follow his law and earn his approval. Your only two choices are usually moralism or relativism. But if you look in Judges 2 verses 1 through 5, God promises to never leave his people. And later says he will never bless a disobedient people. He never separates his love from his law. This brings us to the second part of the act, the hero of the covenant. How do we resolve this tension? It's in Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The penalty of the law had to be taken on himself so that his righteousness could be given to us. This is how God can be both the just and the justifier. Is the blessing of God conditional or unconditional? Yes. On the cross, Christ absolutely fulfilled the conditions of the law so that he could love you and receive you unconditionally. He lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. But what does this mean? It means we should have paradoxical obedience. We usually take the law too seriously or not too serious enough. The law should be taken very seriously because Christ died to fulfill it. Also, when we fail, and we will, we won't be crushed by despair. We should have absolute trust. After all, when we get married, it's scary because we say, we will give everything for the other, but how do we know they will give everything back? But Jesus has already taken the plunge and died for you, so there is nothing to fear. It leads to church membership. Everyone in a covenant relationship with God joins others who have the same relationship. It leads to getting serious about God. When people say they don't want any connection to this kind of God, they, they want a simple God of love. God who just loves everybody for no reason. But what good, of good is love if it costs them nothing? How great is love that costs the giver everything? Whenever my wife and I wish to honor our covenant of marriage, we watch our wedding video over and over and over again. I think I've watched it 23 times by now. Luke 22, 19 through 20. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. He gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took out the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. This is how we remember his covenant that cost us nothing and gave us everything. For he lived the life we should have lived and died the death we should have died. Amen.
as you receive the emblems. We worship with these words. This is my daily bread.
On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this bread represents a new covenant in my, my sacrifice for you. The bread represents his body that was broken for us. And he said, eat it in remembrance of him. He said, as often as we eat the bread and drink the cup, we do so, we're proclaiming what our faith is based on, the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so today we come again to proclaim that this is the basis of our faith, Jesus who died for us. The bread is not his body, but represents his body. And as uh, our brother Adam said, um, the, the end of the story makes no, the, the beginning of the story makes no sense without the end of the story. And this is how God has dealt with the issue of sin and righteousness through Christ who has died for us that we might be saved. Let us eat together the bread that represents his body broken for us. And after supper he took the cup, said this cup represented a new covenant in his blood, blood that was shed for us. Without the shedding of blood there is no remission for sin. Shall we drink together, recognizing that it's through his blood that we have been made righteous in God. Thank you. Let the church say amen.
Mazahana. You ever heard? We going somewhere, brother sir. I, I know, but you ever heard a quiet shout? Pardon? A shout that was a noisy. No, no, no. A very unnoisy shout just now. I mean, you know, you ask the people, you ask the people to shout. Maybe they ain't going to say that you don't. Say so when you get to heaven, you better, you better understand heaven is, heaven is a serious place, you know. Heaven is a serious place. You can't go to heaven, Timmy. Apparently it's a noisy place, too. Noisy. <laughs> Could be some shouting. Yeah, you got to learn how to shout. Do that piece for them again. Let them practice. Let them really practice on could, the shout. Could, could we go onward to the prize before us? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, let's go, team. Onward to the prize before us. <laughs> Better be happy to see the Pentecostal church, you know. A couple of people that don't run past you a long time. Shout! We're so happy to have those who are visiting with us this morning here with the family here at Grace Community Church. Uh, we don't have a long list, but we've got some power punchers who are here, and we're so thankful to have them come and say hello. And uh, especially want to say uh, hello to Deneen and Bob Surthworth and their family who are here. Uh, let them stand and their son with them who is here, as well as two guests, Mark and Alexis, if I remember. Alexis, right? Alexis, and so we're happy to have them here visiting. And we also have uh, two special guests who are here with us this morning. I'm gonna give you the soft intro. Uh, Brother David and Allison Bailey, who are the Regional Director of Ministries Caribbean for the Awana Clubs. And we want to thank them for being here with us this morning. You'll hear a little bit more uh, from them and about them uh, from our pastor as we go on in our program. Speaking about running up and down the aisles, I get the opportunity every once in a while on YouTube to see different types of churches. And I saw, the, especially this, this church that uh, really was profound, the folks would run, I mean, with great speed, gusto, to bring their offering to the altar. Some who couldn't make it through it. <laughs> Which takes us into this wonderful moment called offering at this point in time. I'm not going to require you ladies, especially those of you who are in heels, to run up and bring it. But to prepare your hearts now as we get ready for the offering, I'm going to ask the ushers as they come. Uh, we prefer you to sit down because we don't want you to lose anything while running. We want you to make sure it comes into the harvest uh, so it can be used mightily for his works. I'm going to invite you to stand with us right now as we together as a family of God recite the offertory covenant. Reminds us of the many blessings our God bestows upon us and our opportunity to receive the benefits and the blessings that he has waiting for us. We read together from Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 and also from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 38. Shall we together? Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your substance, then your bonds will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. Give, and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let's thank the Lord for our 
the offering. Father, we give you thanks for the opportunity to cheerfully give back unto you. Thank you, O oh God, for another week. Uh, we were away from each other, but Father, you sustained us. You provided for us. You protected us. And we honor you. We get another opportunity, Father, to give back to you based on the many blessings you continue to bestow to us. An offering, Father, the thanks in thanksgiving for what you continue to do for us. Blessed, O oh God, those who are able to give, Father, we thank you and we thank them uh, for the opportunity to give unto you. Those who are unable, Father, we continue to ask your blessings upon them to provide for them, to meet them where they are, to meet their needs. Bless us, O oh God, as a people, as we may have various burdens and challenges, Father, but we bring it to your foot, knowing that, O oh God, you can deliver us from it. We ask now your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to take this opportunity to recognize those persons who are going to be celebrating their birthdays this week. We have celebrating on the 13th, Gabrielle Neely. We also have on the 12th, and you know I always tell people whenever you put an initial in front of your name, you're very, very important. Elle Marie Major will be celebrating her birthday. We have also on the 11th, Kira Bain celebrates. And on the 10th, Maureen Pustam will be celebrating. Maureen, I was looking at you, it was almost like this was a shock. You remember the day it was your birthday, right? All right, just making sure. We also celebrate with those folks who are celebrating anniversaries this week. On the 14th, Jakira and Michelle Smith, uh, Mark and Kim Bradford. Uh, these folks are away, so let's remember them. Uh, JZL and Shirley Sweeting celebrating on the 13th. And our brother Van and Janet Fowler, who seems to have already left to start the celebrations, <laughs> will be celebrating on the 12th. So let's remember them in our prayers. Let's sing the jingle, please. Let's, uh, remember to call those persons, wish them a happy, happy birthday, happy anniversary. have another visitor that I'd like to pay, pay a special a mention of and invite her to stand. We have visiting with us today Eunice Papal, who is the commander of Awana Clubs at Christ Community Church. So we're so happy to have you and delighted to have you here with us today. At this time, I'll invite Pastor Hannah to come with an, with an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, well, I looked down there and I could tell, but this is some everybody's off on vacation, just about. Um, uh, but right now, we have some other people uh, who will be leaving us, and I just want to call on two of them who have just given tremendous ministry to this church. I don't know if all of you are aware, but this is... Uh, um, Christy and Wendell Colley's last Sunday with us for a while. They're leaving to go to Alabama to pursue studies. Christy and Wendell, I want you all to come up here right now and hurry up. The old people used to say, make case. Not make case, make case. As pastor over worship, I just wanted this opportunity to say publicly, I thought perhaps we would have had another opportunity to do it. But since they're going for a while, I imagine they would be gone for another two to three years. I just want to say to Christy, and by extension, Wendell, because wherever Christy was in ministry, you don't, you don't see Wendell as much, but... You know, he is like they say, the wind beneath her wings. And I can truly say that.
that he is a heart and soul support of what Christie does. But, you know, <clears throat> since Christie has been back from school, she's jumped uh, head and in first into ministry. And she has been stirring up the waters and making sure she can plug all of the holes that she saw that were empty. And I have been so blessed by her ministry. I have been so ministered to. I have been so ministered to by not only her ability, because one time when they started building the tabernacle, the Lord said, now look for people who are able, but he didn't only leave it at able, he said, who were willing. And Christy proved to be a person who is able and willing. She's well skilled in what she does. She took the Just Grace Choir. Now, if you're like me, you have been truly blessed by that choir. <laughs> choir members, stand up and give, give, your, give your choir conductor a hand. <laughs> she took a ministry that some of us said was finished, was dead, was over, and she said, Give me a chance, and boy, were we blessed, and boy, were we proven wrong. Sample one right here. Proven dead wrong, but to the glory of God, I was proven wrong. I wish I could be wrong more often to his glory. <laughs> Chrissy, we just want to say, not only that, just a, tre a tremendous, a tremendous gift to a Awana, you know what it is? That means Wendell, too, very much involved in Awana. You know what it is? Every Thursday night, every Tuesday night, every, every, I know. Uh, thank you, thank you, praise team. I know of which I speak. You all just don't know quiet is be on Thursday night. Every Tuesday night, every Thursday night, I was here either dealing with the children, but not only that. Didn't we have a wonderful Christmas program this Christmas? If you only know the hours of work. Now, her and Wendell, Wendell even learned to work the lights and the sound for that. That's how much he wanted to support her. And so, listen, Chrissy, we haven't forgotten. But more than that, God hasn't forgotten. He has registered that, you know? And I want you all to go ahead. Be brave in the Lord. Melody and I did it too, you know. After our first year of marriage, we went, and for three years we lived in Chicago, and God placed us there for a reason. And um, uh, he's placing you where he's placing you for a reason. You will be fine. Um, uh, now, just before I call Pastor Lyle to pray for them, we have some other students who this will be your last Sunday with us before you leave to go to back to school. Would you please stand so that I can see you? Could you please come up here very quickly? Make ace. Make ace, come up here. Elders, would you please come forward as Pastor Lyle pray for them as they leave? Y'all hurry up. Y'all better thank God y'all are not being graded for coming up here. Would have been low on C's. And in your case, D. Elders, please come as Pastor Lyle lead prayer. Charles, quickly. Several years ago, Christy Colley uh, told me of plans to go to Canada. And um, I immediately went to prayer and said, Lord, block that. And, um, because she's such a valuable, <clears throat> such a valuable church member. Uh, this time she slipped it to me after the deal was done. 
after all of the, everything was all sorted out because she knew if she told me in advance that she was leaving this church to go anywhere, the senior pastor wasn't just going to pray. I was going to fast and pray on her. <laughs> but I've had to come to the realization that she doesn't merely belong to Cardinal and Hope McCarty and to Grace Community Church and especially to Wendell Colley. She belongs to the Lord and if the Lord is directing them elsewhere, um, they, they, go, they go with our highest, highest endorsement. Uh, Brother Wendell was just in the membership class. I was just salivating, um, thinking just how much more he's going to be doing with his, his, his have you ever been blessed with his drama ministry to the church and in so many ways. And then students, come forward, please. Come forward. We've got a couple of them who are going off for the first time. The first time students, stick your hand up, please. We've got, yep, okay, yeah. I'm going to have you come to the front, especially, so we can see you. All right. Um, join hands with each other, please, and elders are going to lay their hands on, on you as well. All right. Grace, we're very fortunate in that our students who leave us come back. Don't you agree? Um, I'm a pastor of churches, and I have pastors tell me when their kids leave that, that they don't see them anymore. But God has been very kind to us. Uh, we have... We have God is doing something gracious with us where our, our, our kids want to return back here and be involved in ministry, and we're grateful to God for that. Let's, let's, let's offer them up before the Lord. We're going to start with the, the colleagues and then the students. Uh, Father, we take this time, first of all, to acknowledge you and thank you for all of your goodness and kindness to us. Thank you for giving us Jesus and bringing us to, into a relationship with him. Thank you for giving us this church where we've been nurtured and helped and uh, uh, matured in our faith. Many of us have found our relationships here and our, our significant others and been married and uh, reared children here. And so there's so much that you have done through this church that we're grateful for. We thank you that we've seen our children raised up in front of us and get married. And, 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 and now, Lord, we want to bring uh, Christy and Wendell Colley to you. We have been uh, ministered to by them. We have been encouraged uh, in our midst, we have seen uh, Christy lead the, the Just Grace Choir, and we have just been blessed. We've seen her and Wendell in their drama ministry and uh, um, dance and, and other things, Lord. They're, they've been so multi-talented. Thank you for all of Christy's long service in Awana and Wendell coming alongside as well. Now, Father, as they leave from us, we ask your blessing would go with them and ahead of them. Help them to find the church right away. We thank you that they have already made connection with Andy's son, Jeremy. And uh, Lord, we believe that you're going to do greater things with them there as they would go about their education. Help them in their educational pursuits and, um, and finding a, a place to live and being settled in all of those things. Give them a good church family where they can uh, be uh, a part of, uh, of building up another church. Now, Lord, we bring all of our students to you. There are some who are going for the first time and uh, Lord, they, they don't quite know what they're getting into, and we ask that you would go ahead of them, you would smooth the way, help them as they uh, find out about their classes and their, their roommates and, uh, and what, what uh, Christian groups are perhaps on campus or whatever church there are. Help them quickly, Lord, to get established that they don't find themselves struggling, homesick, not knowing what, what to do or where to go. Sort that out. Bring to them Christian friends. Uh, who, who know the church, who, who can take them around in those early days of needing to move around. Uh, for our returning students, Lord, thank you for them. Thank you for a summer of rest. Help them, Lord, to get back into study mode. Preserve and keep them. We ask that you would frustrate every plan of the enemy to ruin them, to distract them, to keep them from being their very best. Uh, help us as parents, Lord, who are still trying to figure out where is the money going to go, come from, and uh, how is this terms bill is going to get paid and will the scholarship come through we dedicate them to you and, and pray that with our own eyes we would see you work these things out bless them sustain them give them traveling mercies we ask in jesus name amen amen go with god students go with god
Okay, folks, we are about to hear the spoken word. Before we do that, we all stand and join in Master Speak. introduce the speaker. No, I'm not the speaker today. We have the privilege of having the regional director of ministries for the Caribbean who will address us. I'm going to introduce him in just a moment. But before that, I want to let you know that the mission team members returned safely, and I'd like to show them to you. Mission team members, please stand. Here they are. All right. Um, team members, there's a meeting on Thursday, 6.30, Tina, at Jules' house. Oh, right here at church. Right here at church. We'll be meeting here at the church. 6.30? 6.30. Um, uh, we will have a presentation next Sunday for you to see the work that was done uh, and get a, a real good appreciation as to where your monies went and how God enabled us and used us <coughs> to bless the people of Tacoma, <coughs> Haiti. Three churches impacted because you were faithful in aiding us to go there. And now, brothers and sisters, some, is it 34 years ago, Sister Freddie? 34 years ago, you all brought Awana to us? 81, okay. 33 years ago, the Awana Ministries were brought here to Grace Community Church. I can say, I believe, without contradiction, it has been far and away our single greatest outreach ministry with a consistent impact on the lives of young men and young women. I was a pioneer leader many years ago, and every so often someone walks in and says, Hello, Pastor Lyle. I'll say, Hello. Good to see you. And kind of move on. The, you don't know who I am, do I said, truth be told, no. Um, but it's good to see you. Pastor Lyle, you taught me Awana 30 years ago, or words to that effect. And I, I stand there amazed, and they will always tell me, you know, I'm living for the Lord, and I'm grateful for your impact in my life. And so I am so grateful to know that we have been faithful to the Lord in calling young boys and young girls to, to a relationship <coughs> excuse me, with Jesus Christ, and we have borne much fruit. We've also been very pleased over the many commanders we've have had over the years, and certainly under the ministry of commanders, Wilsons, and majors, I speak of Tony and Marianne Wilson and Andre and Shasta Major, we have seen this ministry continue to grow from strength to strength. 
This week they brought in the uh, regional director of ministry, Dave, David and his wife, Allison Bailey, who are the uh, responsible for the Caribbean Awana Clubs. And so today it's my privilege to uh, ask him to come and address the church. Uh, his wife, Allison, is with him. Allison, please stand. They are, they are the proud parents of three children, Ruth Ann, 20, Mary Beth, 16, they like to do the double name thing, and John David, 5, like Janelle and I, they have two sets of family, the older set and, the, and a younger one. <laughs> Concerning um, David, before embracing ministry with Iwana um, Global Ministry, he served for 14 years as an associate pastor, minister of families, students, and children in two different churches in the suburbs of Atlanta, Georgia. So you can see uh, his focus on children has been long-term. His focus on families and students is also good to know. He was educated at Luther Rice University, has a Master's of Arts in Ministry and Pastoral Leadership. Brothers and sisters, I'm excited to hear the word of the Lord that he has for us through the ministry of David Bailey. Is it Pastor David Bailey? Pastor David Bailey, please stand and make him welcome as he comes to address us at this time. Thank you, Pastor, and uh, I know this pulpit was built for somebody much taller than me, so uh, it's not the first time, it's not the first time I've stepped behind one of these and said, I'm going to be stepping on my tiptoes the whole time during my, this message, and so, uh, you can come up behind it. okay, I may do that, I've got this thing so I can walk around, but uh, I want to say I've enjoyed this morning just coming together and worshiping with this church family. This church family understands what worship is. We come together, and we can praise God for who He is, always. But if we're real honest, we can also thank Him for the wonderful things that He does for us. And boy, I sense that from not only meeting with several of you on uh, yesterday, on Thursday evening, but I stepped into uh, this room uh, today. And so I've enjoyed, I've been blessed, been ministered to just by being able to worship with you this morning. And so, so thank you. Uh, I do want to share just a few things about the Iwana ministry. God has, um, and I am going to step out around here, God has blessed Iwana. Iwana is a legacy ministry. Uh, in other words, it's been around for quite a while. Some, it's been around for some 65 years. The founder of Awana is still living. He's one of the co-founders. He's uh, 60, I mean, he's 95 years old, just celebrated his 75th wedding anniversary. And so amazing. But um, in the past few years, Awana has uh, come to the realization that the Bible is still priority. You know, it's not a program. It's not a, it's not a program that drives our church. It's God. He's the one who leads us, and it's the Word of God. And I believe because Awana has been faithful to say, we're going to be faithful to equip leaders, to train kids, children, to know, love, and serve Christ through the Word of God, I believe God has honored that. At the same time, we've had to go through some major transitions the last few years. And I want to share just a little bit of that. About 10 years ago, Awana really began to say, in America, there was about about 1.1 million kids who met in Awana clubs each week in the U.S. Internationally, there was just over 200,000. And we began to scratch our head as we said, approaching 7 billion people and only 200,000 people internationally. Awana had a great pr program. They have a great program. You've testified of the, the fruits of those uh, of that ministry. Yesterday, Allison and I, after we finished some meetings, we went out for a walk, and uh, it, was a, it was a warm walk at about 4.30 yesterday here in the Bahamas. And so, uh, hey, I felt like I had really exercised. But as we were walking through there, we met a young couple who had two children, and uh, we began to talk with them, and they said, y'all are vacationing, and we began to share why we were here. And then she said, I, 
I went to Awana uh, 20-something years ago here in the Bahamas. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an Awana kid. And she began to share the mom of, these, uh, in this, of this family. And so Awana has experienced great blessings, but Awana uh, knew that we needed to engage and reach more people internationally. And so while we have a great program that you've testified, we've heard testimonies even this week of how uh, God has blessed and honored the leadership to use uh, Awana Ministries to reach kids and to train them, we wanted to do more. There was a big meeting at headquarters. Uh, this was before I came on, and, and they went around, and they were casting vision. They were setting out a new strategy, and they asked Dr. Rohr, I mean, Mr. Rohrheim, the founder, they said, what words do you have that you would challenge us, or what vision do you have as we need to embrace change and embrace a new time of of reaching more kids internationally and, and uh, hey, we're open to change some of the things we do, but still stay committed to the word. And Art Rohrheim looked at the, the board of directors, the senior leadership in the room, and he said this. He said, I can sum it up with two words. The vision moving forward, I can sum it up with two words. And it was, they said, very quiet in the room. And Art Rohrheim looked at him and he said, more kids. It's about more kids. I think what Art Rohrheim said that day is the same thing that when God gave Moses the word there in the Old Testament to the people as they were going, preparing to go into the promised land, the Shema, we know. I think the word that God was wanting to tell Moses to tell the people Hey, we've got to share the faith, the word, the commandments with the next generation, more kids. And I want to share in a few moments from Matthew 18 and 19. I think Jesus shared the same thing. But I do want to just give a quick report. My wife told me this morning, she said, she said you better go through these slides real fast if you're wanting to preach because... I've got a plane to catch. Our five-year-old starts kindergarten in the morning, and she wants to catch the plane so we can get home tonight. So tomorrow morning, we can put little John David in his outfit for the first day of school, take pictures, post them on Facebook, and say, our kid's cuter than ever the kid that's going to school. You know, boy parents do things in America, and I think Bahamas is a whole lot like America. And so um, this is my family, and uh, we are, uh, April the 30th, we changed we restructured Awana. Awana is no longer Awana US and Awana International. We're Awana Global. I have a couple stories I want to share about that. We're all about empowering Christian leaders worldwide to train children and youth to know, love, and serve Christ. Last year, after we embraced this huge transition for our family to leave church, serving in a church, staff in the suburbs of Atlanta, to being global missionaries, and we still live north of Atlanta, and we travel back and forth. And... Uh, uh, praise God for Skype and go-to meetings and email and all the things that we can do and we can be global. And, uh, but we travel quite a bit. But we went to uh, Nepal to train and to get a taste of what Awana has experienced over the last seven years. While we were there, you see my wife and I, you see the two guys behind me. Those two guys are from Pakistan. We were in Nepal. We brought the guys from Pakistan. I, I don't know, but I'm not signing up to go to Pakistan next week. And uh, the guy behind him is from India. He's from New Delhi area, but he's, he's, he's moved since this picture was taken last year. He's moved to, this was in June, he's moved to the border of Pakistan and India. If you know anything about, uh, a little bit about uh, what's happening and the current events in that region, uh, India and Pakistan has been feuding at war for some time, threats of war. And, uh, but we've gathered for a week to train leaders to go back and take the word to train leaders to reach kids to know, love, and serve Christ. But we sit down, and two guys from Pakistan, a guy from India, had meals together and shared our passion for the Word of God and for reaching kids. Man, it was pretty special. Uh, we couldn't go there, but we could bring them to Nepal. Also, the next few guys, the next four guys, are from Bangladesh, predominantly Muslim also. Uh, the next guy, he is, uh, he's just come on with a wana from Back to the Bible. And uh, we have a partnership with them, and he wants, to, and he's mobilized already there in his country to, uh, with lots of network, networks of churches and ministers. 
And so they're in Sri Lanka. And so we've launched in Sri Lanka training numerous churches already uh, with the Awana new leader base strategy where we try to train 40 to 60 churches at one time, walk with them for one year, and how to develop a quality children's ministry with our Truth Seekers material. It looks a little different than how we do it here in the uh, Bahamas or how we do it in the States, but uh, God's blessing it. The next few got two, two guys are from Nepal, and God's working, predominantly Hindu country. And in, 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 in Nepal now, there's approximately 1,800 churches that meet on Saturday because they're not, they don't come from Judeo-Christian values, so they don't worship on Sunday because they have to work on Sunday. Saturday's their day off. They work, meet on Sunday. We have approximately 1,800 churches now that are reaching kids through the Iwana ministry each week. And then uh, the tall guy in the back, he works with me. He speaks Spanish, and so he's working with me as well as our director in the Latin America. God's working in a great way. And I, sit, I saw there, man, God is. God does desire. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you and I are invited to be a part of what God's doing. Um, we're Wana Global now. Um, we have a Wana ministry in Cuba. We, we launched three years ago with the leader-based strategy in Cuba with these guys, uh, Abner and Later. Uh, we now have 200, over 200 churches in Cuba who are training kids through the Iwana ministry each week. That's, that's an amazing thing. Also, we've just launched in uh, Haiti. I'll be in Haiti again uh, next, uh, I think, in September. And so uh, God's doing work there. And uh, there with some kids, uh, we're partnering with a lot of different ministries uh, who are already established, churches who already have partnerships in various countries. We're wanting to just, uh, we don't want to recreate the wheel. We want to say, hey, let's go in and reach kids. Jamaica, the cool thing in Jamaica right now is they're opening uh, for schools. They're very open for us to bring Awana, True Seekers material, where we go chronologically through creation to the life of Christ over two years. They're ask, they're, they've invited us to say, hey, you're welcome to come. Churches can bring their leaders and operate an Awana club in the schools there in Jamaica. What an opportunity. Back in June, we launched with a new ministry partner in Dominican Republic. Uh, we had about 16 churches in Dominican Republic doing traditional clubs, kind of like we do in America, kind of like you do here in Bahamas. We partnered, and uh, we, we met for 414 forums when we meet with pastors and share the importance of reaching kids between the age of 4 and 14. That's when their worldview is created, before the age of 14. A, a child already has, has created their, their worldview, the lens in which they view life. And so we share this with pastors. We told the partner to have 75, maybe 75 pastors, and then out of that, maybe 60 churches would participate in our next training in August. Well, we got there, and there was 107 pastors there at the 414 Forum. And uh, it's a good problem, so I'm a little nervous. I'll be there the 20th, and we're going to train. Uh, the 107 pastors who were there, over 100 of them signed up to send two leaders to their training and said, yes, we want you all to train us over those three days to start Quality Children's Ministry. And so we'll be there, appreciate your prayers, August 20th through the 26th, and uh, we'll be training uh, 200 leaders uh, in, doing, in launching quality children's ministry using the leader-based strategy, the truth seekers material there. And so uh, I actually, I had a phone call about a week before I came here. The director of this partnership asked us, they said, could we go ahead and, and budget and plan to do the same thing the next two years? and train another 100 churches in 2015, the year campaign, as well as in 2016. God's opening up doors, and we get to be a part of it. We want to network with global ministries and organizations, churches, uh, to, to, to multiply leaders worldwide to train children and youth to know, love, and serve Christ. I want to work with people who share a passion for Christ, a commitment to the Word of God, and the understanding that it's important to reach children. And so uh, the Caribbean, you, know, you, 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 uh, you, can, you understand this map even better than I do, but here's the deal. On those islands, on those islands, small, small landmass, there's over 40 million people. And basically a third, 30%, approximately 30% of them are under the age of 16. Tell me a great mission field. Hey, we want to develop partnerships, prayer partners, financial partners, 
who say, hey, I want to sponsor one of these countries, one of these trainings. Ministry partners, hey, you say, we have a, we have a partnership in Haiti. Could we go and do a vision trip when you're doing a training in Haiti? Talk to me. We'd love, or you say Dominican Republic or, or wherever. We'd love to uh, let you see what God's doing through the leader-based strategy there in Advocacy Partners. And so uh, I don't know what that picture is. But, um, hey, was that good, Allison? I scroll through those pictures fast. And so that's all good. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. It, is, it has been a, a, a tremendous uh, transition for my family uh, and me. But God has been faithful. And uh, we're excited for what God's doing and how he's working. I do believe that in, we can look at the Old Testament and we can see there in Deuteronomy chapter 6 um, that as God was preparing his people to step into the promised land, as you read earlier in Deuteronomy, he said uh, on the back side, he said, you saw them worshiping idols, wooden, stone, gold, silver, bronze idols, and how it was wrong, it was republic to the creator God, the God of, of Israel. Well, this was... Uh, this God gave to Moses and said, Moses, is this going on and off? Okay, I'm sorry, I shake a little bit. So, uh, But Jesus is telling here the people of Israel, he's saying as you're going into the land, as you're going into the land, you've got to teach this to your children and their children. He says that in verse 3 and 4, and then he goes on, O hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Here's what you're telling them. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And those words that I command you today will be on your hearts. You shall teach them diligently to your children and, talk, and shall talk of them when you sit in the house and when you walk by the way, because as you walk by the way, you're going to see what you described in that later passage. Just like when you and I ride down the road, when we walk by the way, when we live each day, Hey, we're living in a world that's broken by sin, that's, uh, that's been marred by sin. But still, there's a God of hope. There's the God, the one true and living God. And he says, as you live each day, as you, put your ki as you lay your kids down to sleep at night, as you wake them up in the morning, as you ride by the way, as you walk by the road, he said, you're continually sharing those commandments, those promises with your children about the one true and living God. And so we look here in the Old Testament and we say, yes, it's more than the fact that God loves children. God loves people. He demonstrated on the cross. But he says his plan is to teach children. We see it in the Old Testament. God's plan. But I want to turn to Matthew chapter 18. And in Matthew chapter 18, we see here that that God, this is just, this, that Jesus here, it's just weeks before Jesus is going to go to the cross. You read a couple chapters later, he is, he's preparing for his entry into Jerusalem for that final week before he will be betrayed and be nailed, crucified and nailed to a cross. And so this is just weeks before that. And he's spending time with his disciples. Get it? The disciples had spent some time with Jesus, and could you imagine walking with him, hearing him talk, and how it would transform your life? It's really no different than you and I walking each day with Jesus, the Holy Spirit living inside of us. We get to walk with him and allow him to work in and through us and, and work to mold and to make us. But in chapter 18, I read this. I start off in chapter 18, and I'm going, how could the disciples ask such a question in chapter 18? How could they ask such a question here in this passage after they've been walking with Jesus for at least two years now? They look at Jesus, and in verse 1, they said, At this time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They asked Jesus, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I don't know the answer they were looking for, but I, don't, I really don't believe that the answer he gave I'm going to have to step back here. The answer he gave was the answer they were looking for. I think their question was somewhat motivated by a little bit of pride, a little bit of selfishness, self-centeredness. But they asked, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
And Jesus says, I think I'm going to have to, rather than answer this just with words, I'm going to have to treat them like kids, like we do in children's church, and we're going to use a, a visual, you know, a, a visual demonstration. So Jesus looks out into the crowd and points at some children, and he calls the child. He says, in calling to him a child, Jesus put the child in the midst of them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now as Jesus answered their question, was he saying that children are the most important in the kingdom of heaven? I don't know if that's exactly what Jesus was saying. Because Jesus said he loves and died, he was going to go to the cross later to die for the sins of the whole world. But what he was telling those disciples, I think what he's telling you and I as, as adults, people maybe who have walked with Christ for some time, he's saying we can learn much from a child. Yes, there's much to teach a child, but we can learn much from a child. The reason there's much we can teach a child is because a child is so willing to learn. Boy, their hearts, their soil is so open. It's such good fertile ground. And Jesus answers their questions. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He said those who have that humble heart. That humble heart that's willing to receive, catch this, to receive God's grace, willing to share God's grace, and willing to live out God's grace. See, the disciples asked a question that was motivated by, I think, pride and selfishness. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he said, guys, you've missed it. You've missed the point. You've missed the point. You've got to turn around and go back and think back. The way a child is just so willing to, to trust, so willing to embrace Christ. I read a lot. I love to read. And one of my, one of my real heroes who's written a lot about student ministry and family ministry is a guy named Richard Ross. I've hosted him for some trainings in the Atlanta area. Um, I've been able to spend time with him on numerous occasions, several occasions. And I remember one evening, Allison and I was having dinner with him in Nashville. And Dr. Ross, he's the guy who kind of launched that whole True Love Waits thing back in the early 90s. And, um, and he's older now. And we were sitting there just a few years ago in Nashville. And he shared this with me. He said, one of the most important things as you continue to work with children and youth is never, never, never lose the ability to think back when you were a child, when you were a teenager, when you were a student. The ability to think back and, and to understand the very questions, the very sensitivity feelings of uh, feelings that those kids those teenagers are experiencing now. I think that's something like what Jesus was telling the disciples. Hey guys, you've, you've missed it. Yes, we love kids, but it's, it's, it's so important to share grace with them. And so I don't think this passage was just saying kids are most important, but there's many things that we can learn from kids. Jesus was still wanting to teach the disciples some things. And I look, and from this passage to just a few weeks later, a couple of months later, I look and I think the disciples caught it. They caught what Jesus was trying to teach them. They caught that it's all about having a heart that's willing to receive God's grace, willing to share God's grace, and willing to live out God's grace. I love reading after Paul Tripp. Paul Tripp talks about a couple things about God's grace. And I want to just share three things about grace that Jesus was teaching here. Um, 
I have to confess, there's times when I've read this passage and I went, when I first read it, I said, Jesus was saying that kids were most important. No, what he was saying is we need to have a heart that's open to God's grace to work in us like a child does. See, the disciples caught it. They realized that grace will teach you how selfish you are while grace also motivates you to live a life for the glory of another. They went from asking the question, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? To just a couple of months later, they're standing up in front of the whole crowd saying, this Christ whom you crucified is the true and living God. He is the Messiah. He was the promised one. See, they went from asking a question of selfishness, but must I admit that sometimes I'm just like the disciples. I get caught up with things of pride. Hey, sometimes when there's opportunities to pour my life or to share with kids, I'm like, well, I've got to go do more important things. But the disciples, they were asking, who's the greatest in the kingdom? Wanting some prideful answer to just a few months later, a couple of months later, willing to stand in front of the crowd, willing to be persecuted over and over and over. Ultimately, years down the road, all of them, willing to lay down their life for the cause of Christ because grace had changed their hearts. Grace was continuing to change their lives. You know, I love how the gospel hymn writer wrote Amazing Grace. He starts off and he says, it's amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. But then he goes on to say, through many years, man, through many dangers, toils and snares, it's still grace. But then he says, "'Twas grace that brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me on." See, grace is a process in all of us. And what he was telling the disciples here, he said, just like kids are so open to trust and so willing to embrace, and to believe, we as leaders, as adults, we need that same heart to say, yes, it was grace that saved a wretch like us, but it's grace that's going to continue to keep this heart, this soul in our hearts, to grow and to continue sharing grace with others. See, grace will teach you. It teaches me sometimes. It taught the disciples how selfish we are that God loves us and there's nothing we can do to receive it and there's nothing we can do or to earn it or to keep it but it's just the fact that God loves us but when we began to encounter that and we began to live that that grace is what motivates us to live out our life for the glory of others yes to invest in children second thing grace will expose the depths of our rebellion while grace will at the same time work in our hearts with the desire to obey whatever he's calling us to do today, to do tomorrow. Oh, a mission team to go, but people to serve every week. I, I, I appreciate what you did earlier with the, with the young people up here, with the young pe people up here, and how you commended a young couple who have served here. You know what that's a picture of? A young couple who's grown up. And they're in young adults, but they're still willing to listen to the voice of God and obey. A ministry that may have seemed like, hey, it's on the decline. But God spoke to their hearts and said, we can serve there. They were willing to obey in that step. What's God calling us? In what way is God calling you and I to obey him this next week? this next church year, this next just to obey and say, I'm willing. I, God, I'm willing for you to continue working your grace in, in and through me in my life as I receive that grace to serve, as I receive that grace to share and just live it out. Hey, but grace will also reveal the extent of your weakness while it gives you, while grace gives you the power beyond what you ever knew possible. Man, now we could start in the Old Testament and just walk through. You say, well, grace is something that we learned in the second part of the story, as our brother shared earlier. There's that strand of grace by faith. 
that's all the way from Genesis all the way up to today. See, Moses, Moses give all the reasons for his weakness. And God said, but the I am is going to be with you. I'm going to be with you, grace. And God did amazing things through him. But all he could see was his weakness. I stutter. Well, for me, I use the southern draw of southern English real well. And uh, some people listen to me and go, boy. And so many times I stand up and go, oh, goodness, these folks are going to say, that guy can slaughter the king's English. We all have our excuses. We all have our excuses. Moses had his excuses. But you know what? God loves it when we realize that in our weakness, he can be made strong. And that's what grace is. Hey, we look at a kid and we say they're so fragile. They're so... But God can do amazing things with a heart that's willing to be soft like a kid. Just willing to trust. And God says, I'm going to save you then, and I'm going to keep working through you through all the years. What I need today is, is grace. What you need today is God's grace. We need to be reminded that there's nothing we did to earn it, to earn God's favor. And there's nothing we can do to keep it. But when I began to realize how he loves me and as weak and, and, and insignificant as I f feel that I am, when we began to see just how dependent we are on him, then he wants to do something that we've never dreamed of, exceedingly abundantly above anything we could ever ask or imagine. I look at these adults, and I was hearing uh, uh, Andre share with me about different ones who've served and how they've grown up, and he remembered. He's old. He remembers like when all, those guys, all these students up here were little kids in Cubby's uh, vest, and so he was sharing that. But you know what? There was probably a lot of adult leaders who were really tired on those Tuesday nights. Who were, but you know what? They said, I'm weak, but I'm going to go up there and listen to some verses for some kids. Or I'm going to teach them, I'm going to teach a story for 30 minutes and head home. I'm going to teach a Bible story during council time. They were weak, they were tired. But then you can look up here, this generation that we prayed for a few moments ago, and you can go, wow, in our weakness, in our feeble efforts, God does amazing things. And to think that one of these young couples was serving, leading in a huge way. And, you, and, and there was many leaders, servant leaders who had a small part in it. Hey, when I began to embrace God's grace, the disciples embraced God's grace here. Yeah, Moses did also. Um, I love the story. I think your pastor shared it a couple weeks ago or last week with Elijah and Elisha. Boy, that's a great passage. Oh, Elijah... When he was up there and tired in the cave, despair, weak, you know what God says? That's great. Yeah, you experienced my power up there on Mount Carmel. But hey, now you're in the cave and you're tired. You feel weak. You feel worn out. You feel like you're the only one. Yeah, when we begin to feel, when we began to realize the extent of our weakness, God says, hey, I've got something much, pow much more powerful. And I think he shared with you. He went down there and he said, go anoint these three to be the leaders to follow you. And then look what happened through the life of Elisha. Twice as many times God spoke in a great way to Elisha than he did Elijah. Twice as many miracles are recorded through Elisha's life than Elijah. But here's the part I love. It's what Elijah began up there on Mount Carmel. You know, there's a few hundred prophets of Baal. Heads got cut off down there in the valley after that great showdown. See, through the life of Elisha, there was a young guy who's grew up whose name was Josiah and Josiah became king and at the age of eight and during his reign y'all know the story what happened he put out a decree and burned down tore down all the altars of Baal throughout the whole land of Israel guys what we you began 30 years ago pouring into the life of some kids here's the exciting thing and I'm stepping on my tip I'm standing on my tiptoes now but um here's the exciting thing Here's the exciting thing. What you begin, hey, our faith can't see. 
We don't know what God's going to do a generation and a half later with these leaders who are standing up here on this. We might have, we might, we might have just seen the, the small part. That's what Elijah saw, just the small part. Then Elisha saw the big part. Hey, gener generation and a half later, hey, we better hold on. You better grab onto your seats. What God's going to do through the young people that you're pouring your lives into. Grace reveals the extent of our weakness. Hey, it was true. It was truth, true through all those guys in the Old Testament. We could just go on and on and on. But then the disciples, it was so true in their lives. And then Paul. And then Paul, he just spells it out for us in Philippians. He says, uh, I want to read it. In Philippians, talking about our weakness, just allows God to be strong and do more than we could have ever imagined. He says this, let do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. I think the reason he wrote that is because it was the disciples' tendency to do things out of selfish ambition and conceit. It's my ambition. I, I must confess, you, you're probably much more spiritual than I am. I know you are. Or maybe you'd say, I struggle with the same things. But he says, do not do things out of selfish ambition or conceit. It's our tendency sometimes because we're still walking around in this old flesh. But he says, but in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. That's what, that's what Jesus was telling the disciples that day. Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And he brings a child up there and sets a child there. Unless you have humility like this. What does he tell the disciples? Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. When I see kids... I, mean, I, I love it, hanging out. I went to the Braves, ga Braves game the other night, Atlanta Braves game, a few weeks back. Picked up a couple of our college kids who are going to college down at whew, Georgia Tech and Georgia State. That's horrible. They ought to go to University of Georgia where the Bulldogs play. But anyway, um, and, I, and, and I, I was scared to ask this sharp couple up here that's going to Alabama. I hope they're not going to the University of Alabama Roll Tide. Oh, I'm like... Pastor, you should have been fasting and praying and kept them here. That would have been a mistake. But no, just kidding. Um, but I stopped and picked up those teenagers. I mean, those, they're not teenagers anymore. They're adults. And uh, one's in grad school. One's already working. And, um, and I began to look at those adults. Uh, my daughters were with me, and a couple of these girls were older. They actually used to babysit my girls. But they were in our youth group. And as I began to look at those young ladies, I began to think, God's doing a lot, God's doing and going to do a lot more through their lives than I ever dreamed of him doing through my life. See, when we look at the young people that we're teaching and we think about grace in our hearts and in their hearts, here's what we see. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves I looked at those young ladies and I went wow we had a small part in investing in them and now God's just going to do amazing things through their lives that's our prayer for our own children but he says it's sometimes a challenge that we get want to keep our eyes on ourselves and not others or the next generation but let each of you look not only to his own interest but also to the interest of others have this mind among yourselves, which was also yours in Christ Jesus. See, the reason he says this is because it's motivated by the demonstration of God's grace that he showed us, gave us on the cross. Who, though he was in the form of God, he did not count it equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of the death, even death on a cross. But therefore, God also highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father.
Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? There's a name that's above every name. Jesus Christ. And he extended grace to you and I so that we could know him. You and I just have the privilege to receive that grace, to share that grace, and to live out that grace. And there's a whole generation following us. They're impressed with God's grace. Let's live it out. Can I pray? Dear God, we love you. We thank you for the privilege of knowing you this day. Lord, I thank you for the privilege of trusting you and walking with you. There's no greater peace, there's no greater joy that we can experience than the, and no greater love than the reality that we belong to you. And Lord, I thank you that it, you made it by grace for me as a 12-year-old boy that I could just accept your love for me, confess my sins, and accept your love. And then, Lord, that it's by your grace that seals us and, and keeps us. But, Lord, I pray that as never before, your grace would motivate us to serve you, to, to enjoy walking with you, and that we would do it in such a way that the generations that follow would say, I want to I know that Christ. I want to know that. I want to live that. I want to walk each day with Jesus. God, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the privilege of, of just knowing you today and trusting you. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand us together, we. our time together let us continue to ask the Lord for grace his grace has kept me safe this far and what his grace will lead me home if there's a prayer you can pray when all other prayers fail say Lord pour out your grace and favor on this or that person amen father we've come to the end of a time of worship and serving you we've we've heard your word We've had an opportunity to worship Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We have been treated to an opportunity in this life to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're so grateful for that. Now, Lord, we're moving into a whole week, and we ask that your grace would sustain us and take us through. Thank you for Brother Bailey and his wife, Allison, uh, for their ministry, not just to us, but uh, to the Caribbean and uh, places far away like Nepal and India and Pakistan. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you would keep our brothers and sisters ministering in those places safe and secure from all alarm. Now then unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. The service is over. But your service to the Lord remains. Go and serve the Lord with all that you have.
Now 